Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Get Secure. I'm your host, Mike Belanger 40, and today we have episode seven of the series on the Gilgo Beach serial murders, and I'm joined by former Suffolk County Police Commissioner uh, Richard Dormer. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good morning. So, um, so we're wrapping it up today. Um, you know, seven, seven episodes um, on Gilgo Beach, um, probably the longest uh, media stint um, on this particular case. I mean, we know you were on camera a lot. Um, you did multiple interviews, um, both on the local, with local media as well as with uh, national media. But I believe that on this web show right here on the Daily Blue, I, th I think that we've had the longest continual uh, series to really talk about the case uh, from its in inception with Shannon Gilbert and the missing persons case. Um, through all of the bodies that were found and all of the connections and similarities. Um, so I think it's been a fascinating series. Um, and today, we just want to, I, I just want to wrap it up. And I, I want to talk specifically um, about profiling a serial killer. And it's, uh, and, and, and profiling is, um, it's done by the FBI uh, uh, Behavioral Science Unit. Uh, they do criminal profiles on, on everybody, mostly killers, um, but um, the profile provides um, law enforcement professionals with essentially um, an outline of what might this guy be thinking, um, what's his background, and it's, uh, and it's not an exact science how they do it, but after you, it, there's, there's psychological elements, and, and I just want you to speak a little bit about um, why don't we talk about the generalization of serial killers in general, and then let's get specific into the profile of the Gilgo Beach serial killer. Well, we know a lot about serial killers from past history. Uh, you know, the FBI had uh, a comprehensive program where they would go interview these serial killers that were locked up in prison and, uh, you know, actually get into their psyches, into their minds. Uh, you know, what made them tick? And so that's very important when they do an analysis of, of the people involved in this thing. But, uh, you know, I would like to uh, uh, read some notes that I've made on this about serial killers. And usually the killing of a person is in the context of power, sexuality, and brutality. We're talking about serial killers now. And these serial killer crimes create an awful lot of fear in the communities. Even though uh, regular folk in this instance are not the victims, uh, it, the victims are prostitutes, there's great pressure on the investigators, on the police agency, to solve the case. And there are usually a lack of clues, uh, not like television. Uh, we don't have DNA, we don't have fingerprints, we don't have trace evidence, uh, because it's stranger to stranger type of uh, killing. Uh, most killings and murders are not planned. Less than 5% are planned. These serial killers plan, plan their uh, killings. Uh, their M always to entice the prostitutes, in this case, into the web, and then the, uh, the uh, signature is what they do with them after they get them into their web. Majority of serial murders are sexual in nature, and we believe that this is a sadistic sexual killer. This is not new. Uh, this has been going on for uh, hundreds of years, uh, serial killing. But because of the publicity and the, the media uh, involvement now, it seems to have increased. But that's not yeah. particularly I mean, I, true. I also equate, you know, sometimes so, so far as media attention is concerned um, with uh, serial killers. I mean, homicides happen every, every day, unfortunately. You know, people are dying every day, uh, victims of homicide. Um, serial murder cases. Um, I almost equate to, you know, uh, like when there's a plane crash and you have a multiple, multiple casualties, multiple deaths. It gets all the media attention. Um, but homicides happen every day. But with a serial murder case, it's, it's different. Well, you know, if I may, uh, what's this killer like? What's this guy like? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in uh, conjunction with the FBI analysis unit in, from Quantico, uh, we've come up with the, uh, this kind of, uh, it's a rough profile. Nothing's exact, as you mentioned at the, uh, in your opening statement. Uh, you can't be exact in this thing. But we know that this guy is organized, uh, rather than disorganized. 
He's very careful. He plans it. He carries out the murders very carefully. He disposes of the bodies very carefully. He takes very little risk. He takes some because he, he obviously transports the bodies or remains, uh, whatever remains he has, to the dumping ground. So he has them in his vehicle as he's driving through Suffolk County. Uh, they say that he's a high birth order in the family, uh, this guy, white male, probably in his 40s. Father's work history is generally stable. Parental discipline was inconsistent in his family. He's above average intelligence. He may work at occupations that are below his intelligence. Or he may work at a skilled occupation, not sure. But he's a pretty bright guy, he's pretty smart. He gets stressed out prior to the killings. And this is common in these serial killer cases. They get stressed out. It's also common in serial rapist case, where they get stressed out and they relieve the stress by killing or raping. He's socially adept and usually living with a partner. I should mention that he doesn't have a sign on his forehead that says I'm a serial killer. In fact, he blends in very well in the community and with his family members. He's socially competent. He gets along with people. Again, sociopaths are like that. Uh, they're very glib. Uh, everybody loves them, but they're very, very devious. Aggressive acts prior to the debt. And we know that this guy was involved in aggression. We have some information that shows he was a very aggressive person. And hiding the body is part of it. Now, he obviously hid the bodies. I by just stop you there. When you say aggressive um, before committing the act of homicide, what do you mean by aggressive? Well, some information that we have, and I can't divulge the information that we have from the forensics and from the medical examiner, but it will indicate that uh, he spent some time with the bodies. And he hides the bodies. He now, spent some time with the bodies anti-mortem, post-mortem, both? Post before? Po possibly before, mm -hmm. too. Uh, this is not uncommon with serial killers where they play with the victim. Uh, this is how they get their grat gratification. Their sexual gratification is from their power over the victim. Right, but what you are saying, and then you can't divulge uh, specifics, um, obviously, because it's an ongoing investigation, but what you are saying is that the, the victims of the Gilgo Beach serial killer were, were tortured. I, I mean, that's the, I'm that's not the, say that, Mike. Well, that's the conclusion that I could well, draw. I'm just saying because if they, if they spent time with them, I, I just... Uh, well, this is common with serial killers, okay? And there's indications that this may have occurred in the uh, Gilgo Beach uh, murders. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to go into any details. Obviously, uh, we can't divulge, uh, uh, you know, information that the uh, homicide squad has. But again, it's not just bringing somebody into your web and killing them immediately and disposing of the body, okay? And looking at past history with serial killers, Okay, they get the gratification for spending time with the victim. And so that's not uncommon. In fact, that's where they get their pleasure from. And they become addicted to that. We believe that this guy is addicted to killing prostitutes. And he may be continuing to do that today. Uh, and by the way, I should mention that hiding the body is part of that. Now, he didn't take too much of a risk by uh, attempting to bury the bodies. It takes too much time. So from the time he pulled up on the side of the highway at Gilgo Beach till he walked through the uh, brush, dumped the body on the other side of the brush, got back to his vehicle and left, was less than 30 seconds. It's still risky because somebody could see him, a police officer could pull over to check on why the vehicle was parked there. But that risk is what may uh, you know, uh, catch this guy. I just want to talk he, about risk for a second because um, sure there's risk in you committing homicide, uh, killing somebody. There's risk. There's risk in um, putting a body in the trunk of your car. There's risk in uh, disposing of a body. But you know what I haven't talked about is is the risk in where do you think, um, and, and again if it's confidential information fine, but if we could talk even in a generalization, 
and we're talking about risk, what about where, what, where did he kill these victims? Because um, if they were tortured, if they were, if he played with them for a time, as as you said, if he if he held his victims for a prolonged period of time. Um, I mean, an assumption can, can be made that, you know, it couldn't be in some apartment building where people would overhear what he's doing. We've talked about that he's, he's, he plans this stuff out, that he's careful about what he does. Um, so my, my assumption, I'm not trying to play an armchair investigator here, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking like I was as a former squad commander in the NYPD that he would have to be in some type of an isolated area. What's, what are your thoughts? Yeah, he'd have to be in a private area. Uh, if, he's, if he's living with a family, his family is away. Okay, and we looked at that. That's part of this equation. This is something we've looked at, uh, the investigators looked at. Does he have a warehouse uh, someplace? Does he have a private area where uh, he can have these victims for, for some time, uh, where nobody will disturb him? Uh, the victims were all uh, small, petite-type females, which uh, we figure is easier to control and also easier to dispose of uh, when you have to carry them out of a building or an apartment. You could put the body parts in a bag. Uh, now, four of the victims were intact, uh, and that, that became an issue when we looked at uh, profiling or an analyzing this guy, uh, and the experts in the field tell us that these guys evolve. Uh, the first uh, bodies were dismembered. The last four that we found were not dismembered. Why? And the experts tell us that they evolve over time. Maybe it was too much trouble to uh, uh, dismember them mm -hmm. uh, because the bodies, the first bodies weren't found. Remember this guy, we believe, was active in Suffolk County for about 14 years, 14, 15 years. And so maybe it was too much trouble to dismember them. Maybe he didn't get satisfaction from dismemberment anymore because that's part of what serial killers and this dismemberment uh, uh, dynamic, they get a kick out of this. This is part of the dynamic, the, the, the sadism, uh, the turn on for them, so to speak. So the experts are telling us that that's not unusual, that the signature changes. That would be the signature. Now- Well, the sadism is, um I mean, people, uh, sick people, actually take uh, sexual pleasure um, in seeing other people in pain, um, and that's, I mean, that by definition, that's uh, uh, sad well, an example of uh, sadism. That's what we're but talking it, about here. This guy got, uh, he, and, he, and you become addicted to it, by the way. Uh, he's got an addictive personality. That's why we believe that he hasn't stopped killing, uh, which leads us into where do we go from here? You know, we've had, we recovered the ten body, the ten remains, uh, they're all connected. My, uh, my belief is they're all connected because they're all connected to Gilgo Beach. So the probabilities are that it's one killer. How do you bring this guy in? How do you reel him in? My belief is that our best uh, investigative tool is the media. Uh, shows like we're doing, by the way, where we reach out to the public. And, uh, you know, I would recommend that on the anniversaries of the finding of the bodies, of the finding of the remains, that uh, the police department, the task force, have a press conference attended by national media, local and national media, and again, uh, display the uh, information we have, which I, I have here from the bodies that were, uh, or recovered right. remains. Right. Uh, I know you want to show the jewelry I want, that was yeah, found I, I, on, I think on that, a couple of the victims. I think that they, on the anniversaries, they should put this out to the media. It may jog somebody's memory. This is the uh, jewelry that was found on the toddler at Gilgo Beach. And um, the toddler... It's very common. Yeah, it's, there's a necklace um, there's, uh, and there's a set of earrings there yeah, as well. It's very common jewelry. That was on the toddler, seven miles away. The same type of jewelry found on the mom. Mm -hmm. Now, why seven miles away from the toddler? It's so always this, a question I had, because there was another, another body found in such close, close proximity to the toddler, but the mother uh, is found seven miles away. Yeah, um, I can't this, explain this stuff. Well, this is the riddle. Uh, by the way, uh, if a toddler goes missing in somebody's family, uh, there's an outcry. 
the police are called, uh, the family members want to know where uh, their niece is, uh, that kind of thing. That didn't happen in this instance. There's no report of this child being uh, missing. There's no DNA in the database. The same uh, for the mom. Right. Her DNA is not in the database. This indicates to us, and the experts tell us this, that they were in the sex business. And she brought the toddler with her. As horrendous as that is to, to, uh, to think about that, this happens in that business. And the other thing that, they, that I believe should be put out to the media is the Asian male. Because we Man, why found... Don't you hold, yeah, hold that up so people can see that, yeah. That's an Asian male. Mm -hmm. Again, again, the Asian male was not in the database. His DNA was not in there. He was wearing women's clothes. He was involved in the uh, sex business. Mm -hmm. He was probably uh, a prostitute. And we believe the same guy murdered this guy. And so, Baby Hope That's is also important, you know, before we move on, is um, that the Asian, um, the Asian male was uh, wearing women's clothing, and he was also the victim of a homicide. But we also know that the Asian male was killed by blunt force trauma, which I know to you and, and myself, you know, certainly indicate that the killer didn't realize that uh, he was a guy. Um, and when he, I think he probably, when he did come to the realization, he acted in, in rage, thus blunt, for yeah, blunt the theory force trauma. Yeah, the theory mm -hmm. is that he, uh, uh, you know, connected with this fella on, uh, you know, Craigslist or Backpage, uh, you know, something like that. And then when he encountered this subject, it wasn't a female. And so, again, uh, this guy's a very uh, aggressive, angry uh, type of person. And blunt force trauma to this victim's head. Why was this person not reported missing again? Because he was in the sex business. Right. They all come back to the sex business. And, you know, this brings us to another point. Uh, this weekend, uh, in one of the local newspapers, there was a big article about uh, uh, sugar daddies, where college students in New York City are now uh, making arrangements with uh, older uh, men. These are females. Mm -hmm. Older men who pay them money for companionship. Mm. which includes, includes sex. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not uncommon. This is a big phenomena right now. So the Gilgo Beach killings and the, the killings of prostitutes have not deterred uh, women from engaging in this kind of behavior, which, by the way, is very risky. The same thing on Backpage and Craigslist. You see the uh, sex workers are still advertising their, uh, their wares. So you would think that they would be very careful in who they would... Uh, uh, you know, meet with, uh, go to a private location with. Uh, the, these guys are very glib. This serial killer is very, very glib, very smooth. He talks these women into uh, meeting him. And so do you this think, do you sociopathic think, personality, that's what they do. Do you think that the killer in Gilgo ever got cold feet with a victim where there was apprehension? Yeah, they don't kill everybody they're in contact with. Again, we know this from history. Uh, something happens. Uh, it can happen in their psyche, where they, they just don't have the killing urge anymore. Uh, the psychologist, uh, the forensic psychologist, you know, tried to figure this out. What turned the person off? But we believe, and I believe, that this guy was in contact with prostitutes, sex workers, that he didn't kill. And so, that's something that the task force should concentrate on, and they have been. They've been uh, in constant contact with uh, the sex workers through their organization, through the individual sex workers, and trying to get information from them about uh, coming to Long Island, the locations that they come to, uh, what type of person, what type of location. Again, it goes into uh, this whole analysis of where he would have the, the, but the where would all the killer, to do these killings? But the killer at some point is making a determination as to whether to kill or not to kill. And my thought is uh, the, um, the prostitutes that he didn't kill, if he ever tipped his hand at all. It's possible. But I believe that when he con contacts a, a, a prostitute and makes an arrangement with them, he's made the decision to kill them. Uh, they're going to be his victim. 
because he's very specific in the type of uh, prostitute that he has meet that he comes to meet him. They don't have a driver. They don't have a pimp. They come alone, and now he takes them to his location. He's got complete control over them. And the type of business they're in, they put themselves at risk by uh, actually giving up their freedom when they go to a location. Uh, so, you know, if he's twisted in any way, and this guy is a twisted guy, uh, they acquiesce to certain activities which puts them under his control. Uh, now, knowing all this stuff, having gone through seven, this is the seventh segment. Yes. Uh, you know, how, should, how do we reel this guy in? I mean, that's, that's, that's the big question right now. How do we get this guy? Because he's still out there. He may have moved his operation out of the tri-state area. That's possible. Oh, Long we, Island we, is too hot for him right now. But we've discussed that um, serial killers, I mean, by definition, are addicted to killing. Um, they don't stop. Um, and, we know, and we know this. We know this from what we've learned in the history of serial killers. They don't stop. So it's very easy to make an assumption that the Gilgo Beach serial killer is still killing. So there's more victims out there. Yeah. And unless, um, and it's like I pointed out in the beginning of the show, I mean, we're a, we're a web-based show. And sure, there's a, there's a viewership um, and, and out there. But this is more of a national media case. And you bring up a very good point about the press conferences um, on the anniversaries of uh, whether it's the discoveries or their deaths. Um, it is important to keep, um, I, I feel at least, I mean, that the Gilgo Beach um, media attention has kind of drifted down. And I, I, and I guess it's, 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 it's expected. I, a different things come up in a media cycle that pushes things to the back burner. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that this is still an active serial murder investigation. And the moment that we, in the media, and whether we're a web-based show, whether we're a local television station, or whether we're on a national platform, a national media platform, I think it's incumbent upon uh, media uh, to keep a, a case like this in the media so that it's well, always out there. We talk about serial and they, and they slip up from time to time. Yeah, they always Sometimes make, they, talk. they always make a mistake. And I, yeah. I should say too that there's a couple of reasons that you go uh, public with this on the anniversaries. Uh, number one, to let the families know and let the public know that this is an active investigation, that the police department has not gone, uh, has not forgotten about it, that we haven't forgot about these uh, these victims. The police homicide squad is the advocate for victims. Uh, they're the ones that follow up on this thing, and they do that for the families. The families should know that the police department is uh, actively investigating this case. The other uh, purpose is to reach out to the media. Somebody out there, okay, may get say, "Oh my, my God, I got to make that phone call." They f they finally have uh, their conscience. Of, their conscience. Speaking of making the phone call, uh, you know, I want to bring in the uh, the phone number uh, for the Suffolk County Police Department's uh, tip line, which is uh, one eight hundred two two zero tips. That's one eight hundred. 220 tips because it's like you just said um, you know and there's a there's a website uh, up with uh, Suffolk County yeah. uh, Police Department with the phone number to call and, and they can text it too you know there's many ways that you can reach out to the uh, police department now let me just uh, uh, you know if I could tickle your viewers mm -hmm. uh, again I mentioned about involving the media uh, baby hope is a very good example of where the uh, that on the anniversary, the detectives in NYP uh, distributed flyers with the uh, a profile of the, of the child that had been found uh, along the highway. A press conference on obviously the anniversaries, um, asking for assistance. You got to ask for assistance. Sometimes people won't come forward, but if you make a plea, they will think about it and their conscience may uh, make them make the call. Follow up with police agencies outside the tri-state area that have remains, where they find remains of female victims and male victims. You never know if this guy's M.O., this guy's signature has changed. Uh, he's not, he has not stopped killing. We don't believe that this guy has stopped. 
He's addicted to the killing of prostitutes. He's probably found new dumping grounds, not in the Long Island area. So it's imperative that... So if you're police commissioner right now, um, and knowing what you know about uh, the Gilgo Beach serial killer, knowing what you know based on your experience about serial killers in, in general, what would you be doing right now? Well, I'd be reaching out to the families. I'd involve the families because that personalizes it when you have a press conference. And I'd involve not just the local uh, media, but uh, national media. And by the way, if you call a press conference on updating on the Gilgo uh, Beach murders, you will get the media from all over. This is a, still a big deal. It's still a big story. So why are they not doing it? Well, you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, you know, Mike, uh, uh, what I tell the media when they call me, I say, you've got to call, you got to call Suffolk County PD. Sure. I'm not in there anymore. But I'm looking at it from uh, this seat, okay? This is what I would do, and this is what I would recommend. I'm not going to in any way cast aspersions on Absolutely. what they're doing. They're yeah. probably, uh, I'm assuming they're following up on leads as we speak. If somebody calls that number, 1-800-220-TIPS, uh, which is 1-800-220-8477, right. the Homicide Squad will follow up on these tips. This guy may have made a mistake. He may have slipped up in front of somebody, in front of his girlfriend, mm -hmm. his wife, where he's made a comment about prostitutes. They deserve to be killed. Uh, that's not the way it happened. Uh, somebody may have some information, but they're not sure if they should make the call. It may be from fear. It may be from, it's silly. Nothing silly. And it's anonymous. When you make the call to the PD, it'll be, the call will come in anonymously. And a, a yeah. tip with a name right. could solve this case. I mean, I guess um, my, my, my question is, um, are we looking at nationally? Because um, where I would start is uh, missing prostitutes. And even though some of these folks were unidentified, um, are we looking at missing prostitutes nationwide? Because if we believe that he's still killing and he's still out there, uh, he could have moved, he could be relocated, he could have gone to a different state, a different region, um, and there may be more victims out there. They're prostitutes, they're sex workers. We, we know that, the 10 remains that were found, uh, sex workers. They're not in the database. If, a, if uh, an ordinary uh, female uh, from a college or from uh, the streets or the shopping center goes missing, they go in the database. Every police department in the country puts their DNA in the database. The fact that they weren't in the database indicates there were sex workers and nobody missed them. The first four were in the database because their families knew their activities and knew when they went missing because they were in contact with their families. Sure. Uh, utilizing the families for the press conference personalizes it. Yeah. You may have somebody out there that suddenly is touched by the family so and we say, agree. I got to make that phone call. So we're, we're both in agreement that uh, media attention and the more that we talk about this case is what could solve the case. Yeah. And, um, and that's and that's what this, uh, that's why I did this entire series. Uh, that's why we're at episode seven. And that's why I want to conclude now with, you know, first of all, I want to thank you for all the time that you spent with me um, uh, just talking about the case, some of your insights, some of your expertise, and what you lent um, uh, to, this, to this show. Has been um, has been incredible. So I want and, to thank you. And th Mike, uh, if I may, to the law enforcement people out there that are watching this, that have sent in uh, suggestions, recommendations, questions, we thank them too. Because listen, nobody is a complete expert on this stuff. Right. We could all uh, learn yep. from each other Absolutely. with solving this case. Absolutely. But you know, and I want, again, I want to thank you. I want to thank all the people that have been viewing this series. Thanks very much. If you do have any uh, tips, you know the number to call. Um, you could also tweet me at, at GetSecureShow um, on Twitter. So I thank you for watching and uh, thank you for uh, participating in uh, the show interactively uh, through Twitter. Thanks to the Daily Blue. Uh, thanks to Donna and to Corinne and everybody at the station, Corey, Keith, uh, the camera folks, and for Arrow Security for sponsoring this show. I'm your host, Mike Blanger40. Thanks for watching Get Secure. We'll see you next time, folks.